Incidents happen, and as a security analyst, you'll likely be tasked with investigating and responding to security incidents at some point in your career. Let's examine the detection and analysis phase of the incident response lifecycle. This is where incident response teams verify and analyze incidents. Detection enables the prompt discovery of security events. Remember, not all events are incidents, but all incidents are events. Events are regular occurrences in business operations, like visits to a website or password reset requests. IDS and SIM tools collect and analyze event data from different sources to identify potential unusual activity. If an incident is detected, such as a malicious actor successfully gaining unauthorized access to an account, then an alert is sent out. Security teams then begin the analysis phase. Analysis involves the investigation and validation of alerts. During the analysis process, analysts must apply their critical thinking and incident analysis skills to investigate and validate alerts. They'll examine indicators of compromise to determine if an incident has occurred. This can be a challenge for a couple of reasons. The challenge with detection is it's impossible to detect everything. Even great detection tools have limitations in how they work, and automated tools may not be fully deployed across an organization due to limited resources. Some incidents are unavoidable, which is why it's important for organizations to have an incident response plan in place. Analysts often receive a high volume of alerts per shift, sometimes even thousands. Most of the time, high alert volumes are caused by misconfigured alert settings. For example, alert rules that are too broad and not tuned to an organization's environment create false positives. Other times, high alert volumes can be legitimate alerts caused by malicious actors taking advantage of a newly discovered vulnerability. As a security analyst, it's important that you're equipped to effectively analyze alerts, and coming up, you'll do just that. You may recall our discussion on the different documentation tools and types used by security teams when responding to incidents. In this video, we'll examine the benefits that documentation offers so that you can better understand how to leverage documentation as a security professional. As a security engineer who has developed a great deal of detection rules, it was critical for me to document what it means when those rules are activated, what severity to assign, what might lead to false positives, and how the analyst can confirm the alert is legitimate. Without this documentation, a security operations team can never scale beyond one or two analysts. If something was documented, then there's a record of it happening. This means that relevant information can be accessed. This is known as transparency. Transparent documentation is useful as a source of evidence for security insurance claims, regulatory investigations, and legal proceedings. You'll learn more about documentation processes that help to achieve this in an upcoming section. Documentation also provides standardization. This means that there's an established set of guidelines or standards that members of an organization can follow to complete a task or workflow. An example of creating standardization through documentation is establishing an organization's security policy, processes, and procedures. This helps in maintaining quality of work since there are set rules to follow. Documentation also improves clarity. Effective documentation not only gives team members a clear understanding of their roles and duties, but it also provides information on how to get the job done. For example, playbooks that provide detailed instructions prevent uncertainty and confusion during incident response. The security field is constantly changing, attacks evolve, and regulatory requirements might change. This is why it's important to maintain, review, and update documentation regularly to keep up with any changes. As a security professional, you'll likely juggle documentation responsibilities alongside your other tasks. By taking the time to write down your actions, you'll recall facts and information. You may even notice some gaps in the previous actions you took. The time you spend documenting is valuable, not only for you, but for your entire organization. Let's continue our discussion on how documentation provides transparency through documents like chain of custody. During incident response, Evidence must be accounted for during the entire incident's life cycle. Tracking evidence is important if the evidence is requested as part of any legal proceedings. How can security teams ensure that this is done? They use a form called chain of custody. Chain of custody is the process of documenting evidence, possession, and control during an incident life cycle. As soon as evidence gets collected, chain of custody forms are introduced. The form should be filled out with details as the evidence is handled. 
Let's examine a very simple example of how chain of custody is used during digital forensic analysis. Previously, you learned that digital forensics is the practice of collecting and analyzing data to determine what has happened after an attack. During an incident response, Aisha verified that a compromised hard drive requires examination by the forensics team. First, she ensures that the hard drive is right protected so the data on the disk can't be edited or erased. Then she calculates and records a cryptographic hash function of an image of the hard drive. Remember that a hash function is an algorithm that produces a code that can't be decrypted. Aisha is then instructed to transfer it to Colin in the forensics department. Colin examines it and sends it off to Nav, another analyst. Nav receives the compromised hard drive and sends it to her manager, Armand. Each time the hard drive is transferred to another person, they need to log it in the chain of custody form so that movement of evidence is transparent. Tampering with the data on the hard drive can be detected using the original hash that Aisha documented at the beginning of the process. This ensures that there's a paper trail describing who handled the evidence and why, when, and where they handled it. Just like other documentation types, there is no standard template of what the chain of custody form should look like, but they do contain common elements. This is what you might examine on a chain of custody log form. First, there should be a description of the evidence, which includes any identifying information like the location, host name, MAC address, or IP address. Next is the custody log, which details the name of the people who transferred and received the evidence. It also includes the date and time the evidence was collected or transferred, and the purpose of the transfer. You may be wondering what happens if evidence gets logged incorrectly, or if there's a missing entry. This is what's known as a broken chain of custody, which occurs when there are inconsistencies in the collection and logging of evidence in the chain of custody. In the court of law, chain of custody documents help establish proof of the integrity, reliability, and accuracy of the evidence. For evidence related to security incidents, chain of custody forms are used to help meet legal standards so that this evidence can be used in legal proceedings. If a malicious actor compromised a system, evidence must be available to determine their actions so that appropriate legal action can be taken. However, in some cases, major breaks in the chain of custody can impact the integrity, reliability, and accuracy of the evidence. This affects whether or not the evidence can be a trusted source of information and used in the court of law. Chain of custody forms provide us with a method of maintaining evidence so that malicious actors can be held responsible for their actions. Have you ever taken a trip to a place you've never visited before? You may have used a travel itinerary to plan your trip activities. Travel itineraries are essential documents to have, especially for travel to a new place. They help keep you organized and give you a clear picture of your travel plans. They detail the activities you'll do, the places you'll visit, and your travel time between destinations. Playbooks are similar to travel itineraries. As you may remember from our previous discussions, a playbook is a manual that provides details about any operational action. They provide security analysts with instructions on exactly what to do when an incident occurs. Playbooks provide security professionals with a clear picture of their tasks during the entire incident response life cycle. Responding to an incident can be unpredictable and chaotic at times. Security teams are expected to act quickly and effectively. Playbooks offer structure and order during this time by clearly outlining the actions to take when responding to a specific incident. By following a playbook, security teams can reduce any guesswork and uncertainty during response times. This allows security teams to act quickly and without any hesitation. Without playbooks, an effective and swift response to an incident is nearly impossible. Within playbooks, there may be checklists that can also help security teams perform effectively during stressful times by helping them remember to complete each step in the incident response life cycle. Playbooks outline the steps that are necessary in response to an attack like ransomware, data breach, malware, or DDoS. Here's an example of a playbook that uses a flowchart diagram with the steps to take during the detection of a DDoS attack. This depicts the process for detecting a DDoS and begins with determining the indicators of compromise, like unknown incoming traffic. Once the indicators of compromise are determined, the next step is to collect the logs and finally analyze the evidence. There are three different types of playbooks, non-automated, automated, or semi-automated. The DDoS playbook we just explored is an example of a non-automated playbook, which requires step-by-step -step actions performed by an analyst. 
automated playbooks automate tasks in incident response processes. For example, tasks such as categorizing the severity of the incident or gathering evidence can be done using an automated playbook. Automated playbooks can help lower the time to resolution during an incident. SOAR and SIM tools can be configured to automate playbooks. Finally, semi-automated playbooks combine a person's action with automation. Tedious, error-prone, or time-consuming tasks can be automated while analysts can prioritize their time with other tasks. Semi-automated playbooks can help increase productivity and decrease time to resolution. As a security team responds to incidents, they may discover that a playbook needs updates or changes. Threats are constantly evolving, and for playbooks to be effective, they must be maintained and updated regularly. A great time to introduce changes to playbooks is during the post-incident activity phase. We'll be exploring more about this phase in an upcoming section. Meet you there. As you've learned, security analysts can be flooded with a large amount of alerts on any given day. How does an analyst manage all of these alerts? Hospital emergency departments receive a large number of patients every day, and each patient needs medical care for a different reason. But not all patients will receive medical care immediately. This is because hospitals have a limited number of resources available and must manage their time and energy efficiently. They do this through a process known as triage. In medicine, triage is used to categorize patients based on the urgency of their conditions. For example, patients with a life-threatening condition such as a heart attack will receive immediate medical attention. But a patient with a non-life-threatening condition like a broken finger may have to wait before they see a doctor. Triage helps to manage limited resources so that hospital staff can give immediate attention to patients with the most urgent conditions. Triage is also used in security. Before an alert gets escalated, it goes through a triage process, which prioritizes incidents according to their level of importance or urgency. Similar to hospital emergency departments, security teams have limited resources available to dedicate to incident response. Not all incidents are the same, and some may involve an urgent response. Incidents are triaged according to the threat they pose to the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of systems. For example, an incident involving ransomware requires immediate response. This is because ransomware may cause financial, reputational, and operational damage. Ransomware is a higher priority than an incident like an employee receiving a phishing email. When does triage happen? Once an incident is detected and an alert gets sent out, triage begins. As a security analyst, you'll identify the different types of alerts and then prioritize them according to urgency. The triage process generally looks like this. First, you'll receive and assess the alert to determine if it's a false positive and whether it's related to an existing incident. If it's a true positive, you'll assign priority on the alert based on the organization's policy and guidelines. The priority level defines how the organization's security team will respond to the incident. Finally, you'll investigate the alert and collect and analyze any evidence associated with the alert, such as system logs. As an analyst, you'll want to ensure that you complete a thorough analysis so that you have enough information to make an informed decision about your findings. For example, say that you receive an alert for a failed user login attempt. You'll need to add context to your investigation to determine if it's malicious. You can do so by asking questions. Is there anything out of the ordinary associated with this alert? Are there multiple failed login attempts? Did the login happen outside of normal working hours? Did the login happen outside of the network? These questions paint a picture around the incident. By adding context, you avoid making assumptions which can result in incomplete or incorrect conclusions. Now that we've covered how to triage alerts, we're ready to discuss how to respond and recover from an incident. Let's go. In this video, we'll discuss the third phase of the incident response life cycle. This phase includes the steps for how security teams contain, eradicate, and recover from an incident. It's important to note that these steps interrelate. Containment helps meet the goals of eradication, which helps meet the goals of recovery. This phase of the life cycle also integrates with the core functions of the NIST cybersecurity framework, Respond and Recover. Let's begin with the first step, containment. After an incident has been detected, it must be contained. Containment is the act of limiting and preventing additional damage caused by an incident. Organizations outline their containment strategies in incident response plans. 
Containment strategies detail the actions that security teams should take after an incident has been detected. Different containment strategies are used for various incident types. For example, a common containment strategy for a malware incident on a single computer system is to isolate the affected system by disconnecting it from the network. This prevents the spread of the malware to other systems in the network. As a result, the incident is contained to the single compromised system, which limits any further damage. Containment actions are the first step toward removing a threat from an environment. Once an incident has been contained, security teams work to remove all traces of the incident through eradication. Eradication involves the complete removal of the incident elements from all affected systems. For example, eradication actions include performing vulnerability tests and applying patches to vulnerabilities related to the threat. Finally, the last step of this phase in the incident response lifecycle is recovery. Recovery is the process of returning affected systems back to normal operations. An incident can disrupt key business operations and services. During recovery, any services that were impacted by the incident are brought back to normal operation. Recovery actions include re-imaging affected systems, resetting passwords, and adjusting network configurations, like firewall rules. Remember, the incident response lifecycle is cyclical. Multiple incidents can happen across time, and these incidents can be related. Security teams may have to circle back to other phases in the lifecycle to conduct additional investigations.